be a lot of fun doing a big painting once in a while. This one is 20 by 60 inches and it's designed as a frame within a frame, which means that we're looking past those trees in the foreground which frame the rocks in the distance. The original photo was quite a neutral one which has its beauty in itself, but I like to play around with colour and in Photoshop I posterized and recolored the image to make it what it is now. I started with a thin glaze of nickel azel yellow. Yellow is the most common colour throughout all the elements of this image. Using white chalk I did a quick drawing to give myself some guidance as I go along. Using a very large palette knife I placed the pyro, tinted pyro red light on the base of it and smoosh it on and then turn my uh, palette knife here and there with uh, a turn of my wrist trying not to cover all of that yellow background as I go. I like some of the rough edges that happen as I run out of paint on that palette knife. My goal as I place the trunks and the branches on the trees or any elements within this painting is to create interesting intervals which means to have varying spaces between each of the items that I paint. Within these supplies that I used is a Princeton Catalyst silicon blade. It has um, a really interesting tip on it and what I like doing with that um, that I might not show during this uh, time lapse is scratching into the paint with it and it creates really interesting marks. I've moved to a smaller palette knife so it's easier for me to make these uh, trunks of the smaller trees and also some of the branches coming off of the larger trees as well. For the first stage of this painting I only used two colors, pyrrole red light and chromium green oxide. I've pre-mixed several shades of both of these colors on my palette and I have a lot of white on the side ready to go for when I want to tint a little further. This tint of pyrrole red light will become a light orange color later when I give it a little bit of a glaze of Indian yellow. After placing bits of the tints of the red, I've gone into the chromium green oxide tints and placing it next to the reds, um, deciding where on the rocks and stones that I will need that and also in the distant uh, trees that we see beyond the rocks. Because I'm using playful colour, I'm really feeling my way through the painting. I'm using the lighter greens to push back and make those distant trees feel more distant and a little bit darker for the greens in the foreground. To make it easier for me to look at my reference and then to my painting, I place that piece of white paper over the left hand side. While I have a shade of a colour on my palette, I do my best to find all the different spots that that colour and shade belong. This is the blocking in stage. I know that I will go back and make adjustments later on in the painting. For this image that I'm doing, I'm using a method called broken colour. So I'm letting little bits of the background colour show through and later on as I'm placing other opaque colours on top of the colours I've already placed, I'm trying not to cover all the colour up and create that little bits of broken colour to make the painting more interesting. And the goal too is to have a change of colour every inch and also a change of shade. I check my reference often and as I'm placing the marks on the rocks I'm trying to go in the direction of the rocks and give a feeling of the, the face or the angle of those stones. As is when I was painting the trees I'm still looking to create interesting intervals so the spaces around the marks I'm making are kept interesting and varied as well as the marks that I'm placing in the positive form. In this way of painting where glazes will then change the colours that we have so far, you have to have a little bit of patience and uh, be willing to wait until that very end piece where you place one layer of uh, a glaze over all the colours that are created so far. Because I'm using many varied marks and using this broken colour technique, I've decided to do an analogous colour scheme overall. Once the yellow is placed over the greens and the reds and the, uh, the pinks that we see, we're going to have yellow greens, uh, orange colours and red orange and these are all analogous on the colour wheel. Here I'm tinting more of the greens to make these trees look, they're more lit by the distant light that's shining through these trees. We're now ready to add our first glaze of Indian yellow over top of the colours we have so far. Here's some detailed shots of the painting across from the left to the right. Before placing the Indian yellow glaze I want to make sure that I mix enough of the glaze for the entire painting. I combine my acrylic polymer medium with the paint on my glass palette. Then I take a nice soft brush, a great big one, and also I have a, a wet cloth in my hand and I can wipe off some of the paint if I put too much on. 
Acrylic paints always dry darker, so if you're going to use this glazing method, you want to make sure that the shades of everything that you're painting is a little bit lighter than you plan for the end result, because every time we put a layer of paint on, the, the color gets a little bit darker. The Indian Yellow Glaze is nicely warming up the yellow greens and the tints of pyro red light. The advantage of using a global glaze in this way is you create great color continuity. The reason we want to use a medium soft brush for this is it helps us to put the glazes on more smoothly. Some of the watercolor brushes are a little too soft for acrylics and uh, bend too much and make it a little awkward, but you can feel out your brushes and get something that's kind of right in the middle of uh, soft and hard. So here's our painting with the first layer of glaze put on. So now I need to make some light holes into the sky and add some tonal value by adding those lights. We have a lot of mid-tones so far and a little bit of dark and these lights will help us to key in for the rest of our painting. The big trees in the foreground need more texture and more color changes. I do quite a few layers on these trees just to get the right kind of look that I want. After placing these tints of uh, the bread colors and a few of the other colors, including some dioxazine violet, I will then glaze again with the Indian yellow. The trees in the foreground are still somewhat mid-tone in value. I will need to darken them up to make them come forward from the background. I will darken the trees by adding quinacridone red glazes and also dioxazine purple. Because of the creative color, at this stage I'm trying to make the colors balance and push more to one side or the other. I felt that I needed a bit more green in the cliffs to make it look right with the rest of the painting. At this stage of the painting, I'm moving around between the highlights in the sky, the mid-tone in the rocks and the trees, and adjusting the colors wherever I need to, to get a balance for the painting. At this stage of the painting, it takes some perseverance to keep on going. It feels like you might be near the end of the painting, and yet there's still quite a bit to do in the small marks and the little nuances that are required. To find a pleasing placement for some branches, I'm marking thirds on the side of the trunk between the top of the cliff and the top of the sky. In this style of painting, I do the majority of the painting negative space where I put uh, positive forms down and then paint in between. But I do add things on top as well, like these branches that you see now. At this stage I found that the trees still need to be darker and the colors were still a little bit uninteresting. So I decided to add some more color to these trees after I darkened them. Dioxazine purple is a lovely color for darkening reds because it has the common color of red and then the blue color in there is what's making it look darker and a little duller. To create the change of color in the trees, I've tinted quinacridone magenta, and then once it was dry, I put layers of glazes of the phthalo blue uh, red shade. I realized at this stage that the tree that I'm working on now was too wide for the composition of the painting, so I'm taking titanium white and blocking out the uh, sides of the trees to make it narrower. Once that white paint was dry, I glazed it with the original uh, nickel azel yellow. It took a little bit of time to uh, readjust the edges of that tree so it blended in with the uh, cliff face, but it was worth it in the long run. I'm pleased with the variation of color in the tree trunks created by the violet color. We're getting closer to finishing this painting. It's important to constantly assess the uh, tonal values of your painting and to persevere in making sure that you add as much as you need. The small bits of remaining snow on the cliff face is an important part of this painting. I think without it, the painting would not have worked as well. The little bit of cool against expansive warmth creates a great impact. The snow also helps to emphasize the strong diagonal lines running through those cliffs. Well, I think we're about done this painting. We have interesting changes of color, some tonal value changes throughout the painting. And I think there's lots of depth moving from the back to the foreground and we're able to look past those foreground trees into the distance. Here are some of the tools I used to make this painting. The supply list is next. Thanks so much for watching. Subscribe for notice of new videos. Take care.